Hello, everybody, and welcome to TGIK. We are trying something a little bit different this time, uh, using some new software and, uh, and having a lot of guests coming on and joining us. So let me go ahead and introduce everybody here. I'm trying this stuff out. All right. So, uh, so I'm Joe Bita. I'm a, a principal engineer at uh, VMware Tanzu. This is TGIK, a, a, a weekly-ish broadcast that we do where we explore a bunch of topics uh, involving Kubernetes. And uh, this week, uh, I invited a, a whole bunch of folks to, on to, to join us. I'm going to be co-hosting with, uh, with Nova here. Say hi, Nova. You're supposed to say hi, Nova. Oh, hey, hi. Oh, you're, you're awful loud. Something happened there. Um, we've been playing around with mics and levels and stuff. Um, and then I'm also really happy to welcome Alex, Rich, and John, who are uh, the co-authors on this book that was just came out. It was just released, what, this week, right? Or, um, yeah, called Production yeah, right. Kubernetes. Um, uh, you can get a copy of it on Amazon or wherever fine technical books are sold. But also, if you want a free copy, and who doesn't like free, um, you can go to uh, the, the VMware Tanzu marketing page and get access to it um, uh, just for the price of an email. Um, and so, uh, um, so yeah, welcome everybody. Um, we're going to try and keep this really informal and have some chats and stuff. Um, uh, and I think, you know, just the format for TGIK is I like to start out and say hi to all the folks that are joining us from all over the, all over the world. Um, and I think we have some new capabilities here where I can go through and actually start highlighting some uh, some interesting comments here. So, Alid, thank you for joining us. I know you've been with us for so many of these episodes, and it's it's great that we hit 150. It feels like episode 100 was just like, I don't know, yesterday. I don't know, but time doesn't exist now as far as I'm concerned. Um, and like, yeah, I think, um, let's see, we have Martin from the Netherlands and uh, welcome. Uh, Mohammed from Chicago, uh, Eric from uh, Dallas, uh, Fort Worth, popping some popcorn here. Michael from Australia, uh, Zabke from France, France. Um, Tim from the Bay Area. Let's see, so we have some folks from, uh, let's see, Turkey, Scottsdale, Helsinki, Tehran. You know, I'm always blown away. Oops, uh, things moved on. I'm always blown away when I see all the folks joining us from all over the world, and uh, it's always great to be able to uh, to to welcome everybody and and say hi. Um, Morocco, uh, Omar from Somalia, crazy. Um, Osama from uh, from Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Well, welcome everybody, and thanks for joining us. Um, uh, one of the things that we like to do every week is go through and and talk about um, you know things that are happening in the Kubernetes world um, and sort of notes of the week. And one of the things I'm not sure I'm going to play around with our software here and see if I can go ahead and actually project. Let's see if I can make things big enough that we can do this. And then I would love for the rest of the folks to be able to comment on what's going on here. We didn't actually practice this beforehand, and I probably should have. But we'll go ahead and we'll do that. Oh, look, and we have everybody on screen, and we can actually show the notes here. Um, so this is all available up at tgik.io slash notes. Um, and here's the links where you can go ahead and get the um, uh, where you can go ahead and get the uh, uh, copies of the book and such. Um, but there's a couple of things here that, I mean, we don't have a ton of stuff. Nova added some really crazy stuff. But if uh, if you in the audience or our fellow panelists have ideas, feel free to throw some stuff into TGIK notes there. Um, the first thing I want to recognize uh, is all like the container ship, right? So let's talk about this container ship. <laughs> Did you guys I'm, see this? <laughs> I'm so I'm so here for this. I can't wait for this part of the episode. This is really the whole reason I'm here. <laughs> Should have been the cover of our book, I think. Maybe. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's like the ship that launched a thousand memes. <laughs> so those who haven't been paying attention, my wife was actually hiking the the Grand Canyon this week. And and so I think she uh she missed all of this. <laughs> Maybe she was lucky. But there's this absolutely enormous container ship. Like, I don't even like the scale of this thing really boggles the mind that um, ran itself aground sideways during, a, I believe, a, a sandstorm, right? Um, you know, in the Suez Canal. And so, like, you know, 
the entire you know shipping world is totally uh, totally uh, uh, turned upside down. And so it's really, really crazy to see that. Um, and you know the, the the parallels to Kubernetes in our industry, you know, they never stop, right? <laughs> yeah. So what are the best memes that you guys saw on this? I mean, if you if you can pull up pointers, bonus points, but you know, uh, uh, I saw I saw a really good one. Uh, it was it was Ian Coldwater that retweeted it. It was a retweet, and it, it was from a real ship's pilot, and it was like their kind of overview of everything that was like going on behind the actual ship and and how we ended up here and, and what actually was happening. It was really informative and it looks like the pilot of the ship pulled it off and actually nailed it and did like a really fantastic job at navigating concerns. And like, even though like something bad happened in the middle of the storm, like from a production standpoint, like we're actually in much better shape than we could have been otherwise. And I don't know, that to me was kind of like the postmortem where it's like, well, at least we didn't like do this other thing and take all of production down. And so that was kind of kind of cool to see that. Uh, I'll see if I can't find a link to that. In, in yeah, that was a great thread. My favorite meme, though, I think, you know, uh, Keith here is talking about the Austin Powers one. Uh, oh, man, this yes. overlaps. It doesn't quite adjust the, 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 the you know, sorry, Alex, we covered no your worries. face here with Keith's comment. Um, but like, yeah, that that Austin Powers one where he's like, you know, in the little card in the thing trying to like do the three point turn. <laughs> that was so my good. favorite. And they like overlaid yeah. the uh, I think and I know the, somebody did like an O'Reilly book, you know, about like production Kubernetes with the, the ship on it. One of the craziest things was that they, they said it was like the length of four football fields, right? But it had a crew of 25, only 25 people. Yeah, these ships are absolutely amazing. Now, my understanding is that like, and this was part of the thread that Nova was talking about, is that there are professional people that you pay big money to who are, who are you know, you know, allegedly experts on navigating these types of waterways. And so you essentially hand control of your boat over to them with the idea that they're not gonna run it aground. So it's gonna be really interesting to see like who ends up picking up the tab for this stuff because you know I'm sure this is the type of thing where people will be arguing it, who's at fault for a long time. Someone's insurance company is gonna have a bad day. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, let's. Um, so, uh, so Keith here is a, is asking, what's the software that we're using? We're using Streamyard. I'm pl playing around with this for the first time. The fun part about it is that it's all it's all um, you know uh, web based, and so there's no local software running, and so it makes it super super easy to get um, to get guests on board because you essentially just send them a link and then you're off to the races. And so that's actually been working out really well. All right. Okay, cool. Um, oh man, so many folks to say hi to. Steve and George and and uh, oh, there's Duffy on board and Tim. Oh man, that's awesome. All right, so um, so I was checking and um, oh, yeah, awesome. Somebody's adding some of the. You're adding the threads there, Nova. Okay, so the uh, other things I was checking like Reddit to see what's new. These are you know George as he left VMware gave us all his cheat codes for where he goes and finds links for the for the news of the week. And there was uh, the one thing that I don't want to—I don't want to add too much—but there was this really cool um, blog post, um, and this is really interesting. And I would love to hear from from the panelists whether you've seen folks doing something similar here. What these folks have did, and we do something internally inside of of, of Tanzu for managing mission control, where we essentially write a controller that essentially manages a deployment and makes it super easy to be able to stand up um, new deployments and the way and you know and, and change out different versions and control so like have folks written controllers for managing their own essential stack that allows them to bring up shut down sort of like you know ephemeral environments and stuff so i can scroll down a little bit and you can see you know the it's a declarative approach but they have essentially their own crd that talks about their services the shahs bring a bunch of stuff in there I think this is really cool because then they can actually have a very, you know, great, you know, oh, this is a great diagram here. They have a great sort of flow where they would use this to actually then deploy all of their different different stacks. So you no longer have sort of a static staging. You can bring up sort of a staging on demand in a coordinated way. Is this something that you all have seen sort of in the wild, more people doing? So seen it, not as much, but I expect to see it a lot coming up. Um, it's one of those evolving trends that I expect to see more and more. And <coughs> it's it's funny that uh, it's some colleagues and I are working on a similar kind of concept um, for using custom resources to instantiate platform services. 
So it's, it's a similar idea to what's going on here. And I expect to see a lot more of it. Now, when you say platform services, what do you mean exactly there, Rich? Like the monitoring stack, um, cert manager, the things that need to be installed on top of Kubernetes every time you, you spin up a cluster, all those things that you put on top of Kubernetes to make an app platform. Um, I found that using custom resources and controllers to define and then install all those things um, is a great way to do it. Whereas in the past, I've seen a lot of Ansible and Helm, and those are great solutions, and they work really, really well for a lot of people. But um, there's a certain degree of control that you get through custom resources and controllers that is really beneficial. Yeah, I know that that's something that, you know, not everybody has a wherewithal to be able to write a custom resource. Um, and so I think that's one of the things, you know, and across Tanzu, we're looking at how can we how can we do some of those same things? But I think there's always going to be a need for those that need to take it to the next level, need to go further um, and start really customizing it, it more so. But I think it's it's interesting. That, so these folks, they um, the way that they actually bro broke it out, at least I was, I was reading a little bit, is that they have a controller that's relatively stable. And then they have, and I don't know, I mean, I assume that this is, you know, there's there's probably some open source to go along with this. But they also then have this thing that they run as a job to bring some of these things up. But that, I think, is written in Python, so it's a lot more you know, malleable in terms of being able to update it. And so it's going to be interesting to see if we can find ways to, to sort of capture and reuse some of these patterns. That's a pretty interesting pattern, using like a generic operator that then can potentially manage different types of tasks that are potentially malleable and extendable and change, more changeable, I guess. Um, yeah, exactly. that's pretty cool. Yeah, I think this is one of the things that I liked when I when I did a TGIK on Kudo, which is essentially an operator toolkit for for mostly stateful services. But it's the idea is that the the core is relatively stable, but then you can do a bunch of like Bash or Python scripts or whatever for doing sort of the the, the stuff that really is going to you know you want that to be a, a much more malleable. And are yeah. these folks spinning up uh, new infrastructure as part of this operator, or is this just like an environment per namespace type multi-tenant deal, or maybe both? I don't know. I think this is just spinning up essentially namespaces, but I think you know, looking at this in you know connection with things like Cappy and really moving towards the the, the base infrastructure being more malleable, also, I think there's more room to to be able to actually do more of this more widely. Yeah, so really interesting cool. pattern. Yeah, this reminds me a little bit of a pattern that we, I think we, we've seen a ton, which is using operators to either manage or kind of like instantiate or seed namespaces, um, where you make it super easy for teams to kind of just come in and request a namespace. And then there's an operator that just sets everything up for them, sets up all the policies, the, net, the networking policies, the quotas. So I think we've, we've, we've seen that quite a bit. And yeah, this seems to be an evolution of that from, from what I'm seeing. Yeah, no, that whole idea of like, capturing everything that a team needs into a CRD and using Kubernetes to drive that, even if those things are off cluster, right? Like, you know, I've seen like, you know, I've heard about folks, you know, doing something like, you know, hey, every team needs a Slack channel. So let's go ahead and actually create the Slack channel based on the CRD. You know, oh, maybe we're using PagerDuty. Let's actually set up and connect to PagerDuty automatically based on sort of this team structure. And so now all of a sudden you're you're taking Kubernetes as a generic control plane, not just of infrastructure type things, but also really configuring all the other resources that teams need. It's kind of kind of crazy stuff. All right, let's keep moving. Um, let's see what else do we got here. So Nova added some fun stuff here. Uh, Let's see. Tell us about this, Nova. This is this is um, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I follow a few people on GitHub, and I always like follow like the the people in all different parts of the world. And this is something that came up today. Uh, this is just a it's a it's a lightweight uh, implementation that's OCI compliant, written in just native C. And I, I kind of look at this like a bare bones container runtime. Um, so it's it, it basically just like as uh, fireworks or, or firecracker is to VMs, I'm kind of looking at this as to uh, fireworks is to containers. Um, so it's just something I want to check out. I've, I've obviously grew up with Docker, and then I moved over to Cryo CTL and Cryo for uh, all of my kind of production use cases. But I've never really found just like the, the nitty gritty bare bones, just, just kind of run a container and let me specify compute storage and network and leave me alone, right? Like what would that experience kind of look like without a lot of the other stuff. And I'm, I'm hoping, I haven't checked this out yet, so I'm excited to learn, but I'm hoping that, that this might be kind of that, that MVP of just, just shut up and run a container, which sounds, sounds pretty exciting for me. 
So I think, what do you know anything about it? Like what's missing? Like to slim something down, you probably have to, you know, throw some stuff over the stuff over the side of the boat. You know, what, what do you think they actually, you know, took a shortcut on there? Uh, I don't know. I, I just saw it and I looked okay. at it. I have, I have yet to try it out. I mean, if it was me writing it, I, a lot of the, uh, the high level abstractions on top of the kernel that are kind of built in everything of like how, to, what's the user experience for building a container image? What's the logging mechanism look like? How do we manage our volumes? Where does that go okay. on the host system? All this kind of stuff. I'm assuming that that's either configurable or it's it's kind of out of scope for the project, which to me seems seems nice. It's it's a really bare bones. All right, yeah, yeah, worth, uh, worth taking a look at. Cool. All right, and then what else do we have here? And I think the last one, and you did this for uh, you did this just for George, right? Well, I mean, I, I like to follow Linux now. And what I found is that usually features in Linux are, are kind of like set the pace for like one to two years in the future for, for everything else. And Linux 5.12 will be coming out next month. We just got, I think, 5.11.7 released earlier this week. But uh, th this is relevant because we were talking about this on Twitter the other day. Uh, it looks like Linux is, is not necessarily giving up on swap, but it's it's getting less and less of a of a priority for the kernel team, which this is like, this is huge for Kubernetes because uh, as we all know, swap in Kubernetes has been something we've all been kind of like stuck dealing with or, or rather not dealing with as we've looked at how Kubernetes runs on on a host. So just things to, that I like to look at that I felt would be relevant to share. And then while I was in there looking at the, the swap implementation and some of the commentary on the kernel thread, I couldn't help but notice that Linux uh, after 5.12 will now run on a Nintendo 64, which well, is that quite is exciting for me and some of my friends. <laughs> oh, man. So like, OK, I'm going to ask the rest of the panel here. Swap. Like, you know, um, my experience at Google was that, you know, if you start swapping, you've lost. And so like, you know, it's like nothing good happens past that point. It's just a matter of like how badly you've lost. How do you deal with explaining this to, to customers, to folks? You know, is this something that you cover in the book, the sort of the realities around running swap on nodes? I've never tried to explain it. I just say, read the docs and follow that. Just point okay. them to the line that says, turn off swap and don't have a look at it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Duffy's saying that there's some recent work to make swap a thing, you know, on Kubernetes a thing again. Um, you know, we should probably just tag Duffy in and have him, have him join us here. Um, <laughs> I think um, yeah, if, if one of you wants to send a link to Duffy, we can we can have him come on board um, if he's if he's up for it. Um, but yeah, I think you know um, I, it was it was interesting. I think this is part of the you know the Google doesn't at least when I was there generally didn't use swap on machines. There were there were exceptional cases where swap would be used, but um, and I think that that sort of point of view definitely infected Kubernetes to some degree. But um, yeah, cool. And what what were the concerns with swap? I think it was around scheduling being more difficult and, and that kind of stuff? Is, is that it? Well, I think there's a couple of things. Number one is that if you do it naively, it ends up being essentially a a, uh, a sort of a shared resource, that type mm -hmm. of thing where that isn't necessarily tracked. And then the other thing is that, you know, once you start swapping, like performance goes to hell, right? And so things technically work, but from a point of view of a reliable production service, like a, a production service that's swapping is not really working, right? From, from to any definition of working. An another thing I, that was brought to my attention was uh, like a, a lot of what we do at the Qubit level and scheduling totally involves this this arithmetic of what resources do we have available? How much memory do we have? What does our, our disk pressure look like? All this like good computer science-y stuff that we, we try to calculate and make sense of at runtime. And, and swap just, annihilates all that. It's just like, screw you, we have this magic dynamic buffer that we may or may not use, and there's no real good rhyme or reason why. So how much memory do you really have? How much memory are you really using? And so that's that just complicates things and introduces a lot of potential points of failure as we're trying to like create resiliency concerns in Kubernetes land. Yeah. So apparently, thanks, George, for doing this. And it's, it's going to be a little bit hard to read. I apologize. But um... Let me see if I can go up another notch or two. But there's a there's a link to a document there for those who want to go. This is pretty ble bleeding edge, but like what swapping Kubernetes might turn into. I have no knowledge here, but it's good to see that there's progress being made there. Thanks for that, George. Appreciate it. All right. Well, let's go ahead and I think um, you know beyond Linux on the N64. <laughs> um, why don't we go through and I'll stop stop sharing the screen here, and we can go back and uh, enter the the interview portion 
of our uh, uh, of our of our thing here. And I also want to like call up like I'm going through some of the comments here, and you know, um, thank you everybody for so all the all the great comments and and uh, you know, yay on 150 here. Um, trying to find like um, there were some that I wanted to highlight here. Um, I don't know. I'll, I'll find them. We can always go back there and and go back and see. Well, I really if, like Tim's comment. Uh, swap is a noisy neighbor, which that's a really great way of conceptualizing it. I think. Yeah, noisy neighbor from hell, man. It's uh, too many comments. I think we, we're breaking this tool. <laughs> it's hard to keep track of everything. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, so cool. I can I can go into questions if you want to. Yeah, find why don't we go yeah. ahead and get started with our with our questions? Um, and uh, uh, I'll start us off here. Um, Rich, John, Alex, you all can decide which which one you want to start with. Tell us a little bit about yourselves. Introduce yourself. What you're, oh, and the first thing I want to say is that Josh was going to join us, but he he let us know this morning that, you know, uh, overnight he got super sick. Uh, it sounded like, you know, it was something temporary, but that means that he had to tap out. So he, he will not be joining us. So pour one out for Josh. We're, we're missing you, buddy. Um, but the rest of y'all, tell us about yourselves, how you got to, to hear, you know, what you're doing these days and, and what led you to, 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 to write the book. I can go first. Um, so myself, my name is Rich Lander. Um, I'm based in Tampa Bay, Florida. Uh, I have a funny accent cause I grew up in Australia, but I've lived in Florida for about 20 years now. Um, sunny Florida. Uh, I like it here. It's great. I was an early adopter of Docker and Kubernetes. That's how I uh, found myself uh, on this podcast. So um, oh. in a previous life, I was a, an owner and, and operator of a Kubernetes platform. And we went to production in about 2016 um, on AWS. And uh, I worked for a company based here in Tampa. And um, after that, I worked uh, at CoreOS and then Heptio and now VMware as a field engineer, which is Another name for a consultant that helps enterprises um, adopt Kubernetes and cloud native tech. And uh, how I came to write the book was, um, well, Josh, Josh, Josh Rosso suggested it. And I thought, hey, that's, that's a good idea. Sounds like a lot of work, but it's a good <laughs> idea. And that's how it came about. Well, well, was it a lot of work? It was. It was quite a bit of work. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> John, you want to go next? Sure, yeah. Uh, my name is John Harris. Yeah, I'm... Uh based up in seattle washington i also have a funny accent originally from england um i actually interviewed i don't know i don't know whether you folks know this but some folks might do i interviewed to be employee number 21 at heptio um when the field engineering team was just ross uh and for whatever reason it didn't happen it fell through a bunch of weird personal life stuff happened i ended up going to docker um, I was a TAM uh, at Docker for a year and then came over to Heptio a year later. So I could have could have been super early, but <laughs> I got some time in the thanks office. For, <laughs> thanks for joining us, uh, you know, eventually as we went. Um, but and uh, yeah. And so, um, so you know, I, when Josh started things up was the whole idea is that, you know, we brought you in and, and uh, um, brought all y'all together. Was there anybody that he invited that, that said, no, nah, this is too much work? Is there anybody who missed out on the book? Do we know? We can ask Josh. Josh isn't here to tell us. <laughs> he may have asked someone privately, but not to my knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> he did give All us right. the out. We were thinking about it, right? It was like, this is the last chance. We've got to sign it. Like, if no one wants to commit to a year of writing, then <laughs> get out now. All right, Alex? All right. Uh, my name is Alex Brand. Um, nearby Rich. I'm in Miami, Florida. I also have a maybe a, a bit of a weird accent. I actually grew up in, in South America and Venezuela. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I started kind of working in the container space and the Kubernetes space back at a company called Apprenda, which used to be a platform as a service, uh, company, um, uh, where we kind of built containers before Docker and stuff like that existed, which was super fun. Um, that I got the exposure to like C groups and all of that stuff, uh, which was amazing. Um, and then I joined Heptio, which was incredible. Um, so Joe and team, it was, yeah probably the best company. Um, and then uh, VMware. And then today I'm at a company called New Valence, which is a, a boutique consulting company where we um, help um, large enterprises with high-end uh, cloud native development engagements, uh, where we're building um, interesting platforms um, for, for uh, 
yeah, uh, interesting uh, uh, opportunities there. Um, so yeah, overall the book was uh, was Josh's idea. I I've always wanted to do it, so excited to to, to have had the opportunity. So that's it. Well, welcome, 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 and and thank you to uh, New Valence for lending us some of your time here so <laughs> you can join us today. <laughs> All right. Well, um, Chris, do you do you want to you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I've got some questions for you folks. And first off, I just wanted to say, uh, I, I, the second I saw that Josh had written a book, I, I bookmarked the page, pun intended. And then I, or, I ordered a copy. So I have a copy of Production Kubernetes here in front of me. And it's, it's as a, a fellow O'Reilly author, I have a little section of like my friends and family and, and books that I've gotten autographed. So I very much am going to make it a personal journey of mine to go out to each one of you and get you to sign this book here. So I'm super excited for it. Supporting authors and technical authors is, is is so important today when when a lot of the the physical media isn't isn't what it used to be. So hats off to all of you. Uh, but my question is, and the reason I asked this because somebody asked me, and it, it was a good question, which was, it takes a lot of personal commitment to write a book. I mean, when I when I was going through it, it was it was you know we had to navigate children and schedules and work and emergency rooms and all kinds of stuff. Uh, what was that like for all of you? And uh, looking back, what do you think you would do it again? Go ahead, Alex. I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, for me, uh, definitely a very, very big commitment. Um, I couldn't have done it with like a support system around me. So I, I have to say thanks to my wife, who was very, very supportive um, throughout the process. Uh, the team as well, you know, Rich, John, and Josh were amazing co authors to work with. Um, and yeah, I, I think it was overall a, an amazing experience. Um, and I, I think I would do it again, to be honest. I, I loved it. Um, I don't know, Rich, wh wh what do you think? So I didn't love it. Um, it was a very rewarding experience, um, but it was a lot of early mornings and weekends. And there were a lot of times I thought, why did I sign up for this? Um, but as each chapter, like it got better and better as time went on. And I was super gratified to see it all come together. Um, and I would do it again. Um, I would like to not do it um, in parallel with a full-time job. I would love to do it full-time. That would be nice. Um, but yeah, it was. It, it also, on my part, um, required a lot of support from my family. But the team that we had working on the book worked really well together. Since we'd worked together a lot already, it helped a lot. Um, but I was super happy with the end product. So how about you, John? I think one of the things that made it easier to get, like often people say the difficult thing is getting started, right? But I think one of the easiest things where we took a chapter each of a topic that we'd recently done in a lot of depth for some other thing, and we were able to nail those first chapters fairly quickly, I felt like kind of got us on a bit of a roll. And I, you know, I think we'd probably all say we'd like tape it out a little bit towards the end and just had to kind of get on each other and we were like rolling back around through things. I definitely think that getting that first chapter nailed in early was helped out a massive amount. I, I have to ask, what was what was the first chapter? What was the, the chapter that brought everyone together? Well, so we all wrote a chapter we took out of 16 chapters, we took four each and we all wrote concurrently we all wrote separate chapters concurrently and then fed back into each. So I think my first chapter was identity what was yours alex uh, mine was service routing i believe um, if i remember correctly yeah service routing rich mine was deployment models chapter two which Ooh, was yeah which was the longest one um and probably the most challenging to write so it was nice to get that one out of the way to begin with i, th I think all of our first chapters were probably the longest ones and then we started slowly running out of space in the book um so yeah that, that was interesting <laughs> it was awesome. all right George, I'm, I'm asking um uh 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 kubecon book signing you all up for that definitely yeah that'll be fun yeah no it's always crazy to do that you know when when uh when i've done that in the past um you always want to talk to everybody and get to know them a little bit but then there's like this long line and you're like sorry can't do it <laughs> but that would be awesome to to have that happen awesome um you know this is one of those things where i think you know it, oh sorry wrong one here um tim's asking here um you know when i was when when i was working with kelsey and and brendan in in kubernetes up and running you know 
I, the way I write my process, very different. That's the old copy, Nova. Uh, <laughs> very different from the way Brendan or Kelsey write. Uh, Brendan has a tendency to just splat some stuff out. And it's like, you know, we have editors for a reason. I'm much more careful about things. Um, and, you know, and it was, it was hard to get a consistent voice across all the different chapters when you have multiple authors. Is that something that you all sweated? Or, you know, if you read the book, can you actually say, oh, well, clearly, you know, so-and-so wrote this chapter or what have you? So I don't think we would we tried to get that consistent tone and voice, but it happened through review. And an example of that is I tend, when I write, I tend to construct these rambling run-on sentences and they drive Josh insane. So he he would he, most of his comments were, can you shorten this up and like summarize or, or make it a little more concise? So in the end, the result was more consistent. Um, but we I don't I don't know, keep me honest here. Did we do that on purpose? I think it turned out that way. I just don't think it was a conscious effort. Yeah, I don't think we were looking for, we, we definitely did not try to, yeah, to get that consistent voice, I, I don't think, but it kind of happened through, as you said, Rich, through review and, and through editing, I guess. If it wasn't for Alex and Josh, you would have had British spellings everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> that was another thing that came up a ton. We were like, so how do we decide this? Uh, yeah, that was fun. Well, the thing for me is like, what do you capitalize and what you don't? Do you capitalize pod every uh, paper you do it versus rough? And it's so easy to like go back and forth on that, and it just becomes sort of an editing nightmare. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was a pain. I, I drew the uh, the short end of the straw, I guess, and I had to go through the whole book and like update casing and make sure that you know it was consistent across the whole thing. Uh, yeah, that was that was fun. I think that's something that you know. I think all of us on here have actually gone through this process. Like writing the stuff is one thing, actually getting into shape, editing, working with to make sure that everything's consistent. Um, you probably haven't hit all the errata yet that you're gonna get. You know, <laughs> it's like you get these things where people report stuff and you're like, ah, it's too late to change it now. <laughs> you can you can fix the online versions, but once it's in print, you can't fix stuff. Um, all right, so let's um let's dig in a little bit more. What what's your favorite part of the book in terms of advice for for users and and then sort of the least favorite part like in terms of where do you think you brought some unique insights here or you think you did a particularly well job uh, particularly good job of explaining something difficult for my part I think my favorite part of the book unfortunately it wasn't one of my chapters um, it was chapter one which was kind of the point of the book was to highlight the fact that. Kubernetes by itself is not enough. There are, there are a lot of platform services that need, that need to be laid on top to make it um, a habitable place for the tenants, for, for your application teams. And uh, Josh, did, Josh wrote chapter one. He did a good job of driving that point home. And um, that was my favorite chapter. I think my, my least favorite chapter is deployment models, chapter two. Um, and it's not because of the content. It's how relevant it is. Uh, three years ago, how you deployed Kubernetes and, and your deployment model is really uh, relevant, was really relevant. Today, there are so many open source products and commercial product, uh, open source projects and commercial products that it's, it's table stakes. It's not as important anymore. John, Alex, that, do you want to share? Yeah. Yeah, the same. I, th I think probably the first chapter, because I think the first chapter crystallizes really well what we were trying to do with the book which is just be a guide. I mean, I think a lot of technical books, they go out of date so quickly because it's specific tooling or it's specific commands or it's versions or it's, you know, and, and as a reader of technical books, right, that can be super frustrating. So we, we didn't want to fall into that trap. We wanted to be, this is more of a philosophical, pragmatic experience driven guide. And we just happen to be using some tooling, but don't look too kind of like blur the lines there. Don't look too closely at that. Um, and I think chapter one is the, most philosophical, least technical, and therefore reflects our intention the best. That's probably why I'd say chapter one. But. Yeah, I know it's yeah. so easy to make these comparisons of Kubernetes to being, you know, the Linux kernel. But I think that analogy works well when you're talking about like a Linux kernel in and of itself isn't that freaking useful, right? You need all the supporting structure around it to make it work. And really Kubernetes is, is very similar in that way, where it's like raw, bare bones Kubernetes yeah, you can do something with it, but it's really, you know, the systems that you that you bring to it and around it that really make that that value. So so it's great to see that that was, you know, that's where you started to really, really get people off on the right foot. 
Alex? Yeah, for me, I mean, am I, am I allowed to say chapter one? <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, but yeah, chapter one, definitely. Um, and then to play on what, what you were just saying, Joe, I think, you know, building those platform services on top of the foundation. So chapter 11 is also one of my favorites, um, building platform services, which kind of goes into that and how to extend the platform um, and how to, you know, make it m more, much more useful than it is by itself. Um, so, yeah. Very cool. I right, could have said that our, the foreword was our favorite part. <laughs> we could have. We should have said that. <laughs> All right, we have a surprise guest here. Josh was able to join us. Josh, wait, wait, wait. What happened to your hair? I think this is Josh the first is blonde. You're so oh, handsome. You're blonde. What? <laughs> How are you feeling, buddy? That's good. How's it going? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. We got you. <laughs> cool. New book, new hair, huh? Yeah. <laughs> All that writing turned it white for sure. Yeah. Well, we were just asking, um, what was your favorite part of the book and what was your least favorite part of the book? Where do you think you all brought some really new perspective or points of view uh, versus the, uh, you know, the gazillion other Kubernetes books out there? <laughs> yeah. I, I, this may have already been shared, but I, I think like the one thing that's interesting about Rich, Alex, John, and I is that we come from a field perspective of just going in and trying to make people successful with Kubernetes. And it's an interesting world to live in because at the end of the day, we typically like go in and we have to figure out how to make it work. So we have this like absurdly pragmatic outlook on like how we're going to get to where we need to go. Um, and we have a bunch of really interesting shared experience in doing that. So like in short, like Rich and I disagree on so much stuff. <laughs> like <laughs> fundamentally, we we well, I mean, not really. We we disagree on a lot of stuff though, and it's it's awesome because like it speaks to like our experiences being very different and helping people be successful with Kubernetes. And I think my favorite part about writing this book has been like, Alex, this paragraph you wrote, like I totally disagree with it. Like, what were you thinking? And he's like, Josh, it makes total sense. Like, here's my like. It was a good opportunity for us to come together since we're so often distributed with big customers and actually share our experiences with each other. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that about writing the book. So that's a really great question. So I'm going to, I'm going to call an audible here. What are like amongst the four of you all, what are things that you disagree about where you'll just argue it and like, you know, polar opposites, you know, in terms of, you know, well, I mean, Kubernetes related, but if there's other things, you know, that's, that's, you know, I guess that's all fair game. Yeah. What's our biggest disagreement area? I'm trying to remember the last thing we were arguing about. Yeah, we argued about something towards the end. I forget what it was, though. Uh. Oh, you're in violent agreement about everything. All right. No, I think, I mean, one area that I know has been a passionate topic is, and there's a chapter in the book about this called the abstraction spectrum, which is like the notion of, of like, what is the right abstraction? Like, there's so many ways that you can do this. You could self-serve Kubernetes clusters to individual development teams. You could make Kubernetes an implementation detail that developers never, ever, ever should know about. And like those philosophies, I, I think, you know, more so than like you can fit on a tweet, like it, they're valid depending on what you're trying to solve for and in, in your approach. And I think all of us based on our experience have done things from trying to get developers onboarded to Kube where it's completely opaque. But then, um, you know, maybe Rich, I, I don't know if you had more of this opinion, like a lot of the cube primitives, you found a lot of success exposing to developers, right? Um, and yeah, I think that's a big area of contention for us. Chapter 16 on page 453 for folks following along at home. I think it's interesting cool. as well. We, we all kind of beca became, uh, because we are distributed and we always worked on different projects and different customers. I mean, occasionally together, but usually different ones. We became inadvertent advocates for the use cases of the customers that we had worked with. So I don't want to mention any of them, but you know, certain customers were doing this and someone would say, no one does that. And say, my three customers all did that. And then someone was like, no one would ever do that. And like, that's how my customer was running, right? Or like, that's how this organization was running. This is what I read about. So it's kind of weird to bring or smash all that experience together. I was just browsing through the book um, to jog my memory, and it was the last one of the last disagreements Josh and I had was around showback and chargeback, and the model that you should use uh, in order to charge back usage um, to the customer. And I won't go into the gory details, but in the end, we compromised and just presented both options, and then let the user decide, let the reader decide what what's the best option for them. Yeah. Awesome. So, Nova, you want to maybe pick. Like uh, another question, I think you had one from, yeah. from the audience here. 
uh, there, we have a lot from the audience. So we we have a couple yeah. in chat, and then there's more right. here at the bottom. But I, I found this good one because uh, I always get this one, and even when like you know I'm like, oh yeah, you know I wrote an O'Reilly book. Like the first comment I always get is like, what's with the condor on the cover? And then you have to go down and explain everything. But I'm gonna let let you guys take it away here. What's I'll I'll, I'll ask the question in like the best interviewer voice I can. Guys, what's what's with the dolphin on the cover here? Can can anybody explain this to me? Oscar Riley. This is the best. This is the funniest story. So, I, like, I, if you if you don't know, O'Reilly never lets anyone choose the animal. I think super super early on they did, but now they don't because I guess everyone would just ask for their own animal. And we got told really early on all Kubernetes books are birds. <laughs> this nah. is not a bird. There are many others which are not birds. And they gave us an early release cover with a chick on it. So we tried to reverse engineer it. We thought maybe this is the chick of the bird. So we started Googling it and we got the final cover and it was a whale. <laughs> is it is it a whale? I don't even I really don't even know what it is. Yeah, yeah, is it it, I think it's a type of whale, right? A beaked beaked whale. whale. Yeah. Common beak whale, yeah. And what's funny about that picture, um, is if you look at the whale, it looks a little like scratched up and kind of beat up. So it's either like a hint at environmental justice or maybe just representative that like uh, Kubernetes is really hard to do and you're gonna get kind of beat up in the process, <laughs> you know? It's, it's a whale that's like ran into a few rudders and like made it through a few canals. Exactly. Maybe it's been in the Suez Canal, yeah. <laughs> yep. I know how it feels. Yeah. Uh, well, I've got another one here from from someone at home. Uh, so th this is just a general question, and since we have all the authors here, and I'm, I'm sure this gets covered in the book some, uh, what, what is your answer to the age-old question of what do you think? Do you have one big shared cluster to rule them all, or do you have teeny tiny clusters for each individual use case, domain, or tenant? It depends. <laughs> Classic answer. The best answer. Uh, yeah, you ask an engineer anything, you're going to get it depends. Yeah, it's probably like one of the conversations we start off with when we work with customers, honestly, because um, they're always like, you know, I, I don't know, like when you think about like the old papers about Borg and stuff like that, I, I think a lot of people's perception is like, I'm going to bring Kubernetes in and make it this like massive sea of compute in my organization. And what gets really interesting is like all of a sudden you have these general purpose clusters and somebody's like, oh, and now we need like this really nuanced alpha GPU support. And then the question you have to ask is like, okay, like what's the problem domain that we need to solve this for? And then like, do we actually want to, um, to use kind of a brutal term, like uh, poison our general purpose clusters with a lot of these like more nuanced things that only like a subset of teams need? So it is still an age old question because it's still really hard to answer. I, I, don't, I don't know if you all would agree, but like, I think we lean a little bit more towards like smaller clusters, but like even that's a pretty like gray answer, you know, so. Yeah, definitely. I was talking yes. to some field engineers that are working with a customer just this week about that question yet again. And there were there was an app team that wanted access to cluster level resources and the platform team didn't want to give it to them for good reason. And so there's a good reason right there among many. Yeah, blast radius is another good reason. You know, you don't want a config typo type thing to take out your entire, you know, cluster and all of your applications hosted on that cluster. So that's another big one. And we try to be like strategically naive, like instead of like navel gazing about it super hard, like let's just get started and get clusters up and like learn what the pain points feel. Because I don't know, like honestly, every time I've tried to like describe how we should size clusters, I've almost always been wrong. <laughs> if I get it right someday, I'll let you know. But so far, my track record's not very good, you know, so. And to that point, it's it's really, really important to get your systems in place to manage the life cycle of those clusters so that you can adjust as requirements change, because they will. Awesome. I got another one here from, from somebody at home. I, I can just fire these off real quick. Go for another. Um, yeah. So is, is there anything that, that, one, you called out of scope on day one? cough, cough infrastructure looking at Joe? Or is there anything that, that you ended up pulling out at the end in, in, in the book? And if so, why? There were things we pulled out because I Riley said we'd written too much. <laughs> but they weren't, wow, any massive, they, they weren't any huge topics or anything. We just had to trim some stuff out. I don't remember what it was. Alex, do you remember? I don't. And I don't think we, like, out of the get-go, I don't think... We, yeah, I 
can't think of anything that we kind of said we would not cover. I guess we kind of wanted to do not a like a we wanted to focus on maybe people that had already had exposure to Kubernetes. So we won't go into explaining, you know, the, the like the Kubernetes basics. So maybe that potentially could be. But yeah, that's the only thing I can think of. So you kind of viewed it as like a level 200 book versus a just getting started type of book. OK, definitely. Yeah, that's good. Uh, good positioning for folks. I think most of the audience here probably is ready for the level 200 book. But you know, I think uh, hopefully there's some folks who are relatively new to Kubernetes too that are joining us. Um, so um, let's see. Uh, I'm looking at our question list here. And we have so many good questions. Um, I guess um, one thing, you know, I, there's, there's some questions early on. Advice to folks who want to write a book, aspiring authors, you know, what are, you know, um, you know, do it, don't do it. Are there some things that, that, you know, if you did it over again, you would have these lessons that you would, uh, that you would be able to tell folks. So Alex, before I saw you come off mute, I'll let you answer, but there was a question that I saw that says trim stuff out. Why from Carla? And I don't know, Carlos, O'Reilly said we had to trim some stuff out. It was too long. I'm not sure why. On the uh, on Joe's question around should you do it, I, I again I, I loved it. I think it was a super rewarding experience. Um, if if you want to do it, definitely try to do it. Um, even if it's like I, I feel like you can even self publish these days. So it's it's definitely a rewarding experience. Um, I think doing it as as a team as well, like the discussions we had um, along the way were that were essentially invaluable. Um, so definitely a plus one for from me. Yeah, do it with humans you like. It was such a blast, like having the conversations that we'd have multiple times a week. Um, probably like one of the highlights of my career, honestly, is just like the powwow sessions we do just talking about like different concepts. Like, I feel like we just don't get enough time to do that. And since we could rally behind writing a book, it was a really cool experience. Do it. I think everyone has some unique insight, right? You know, like so no one will pick up our book and every single thing will be new but no one will pick it up and every they'll know everything either, right? Apart from maybe Duffy. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> but, uh, you know, everyone has some unique insight. Everyone's going to learn something from what you put out there. Everyone has their own viewpoint, their own experience. You know, like it's going to be useful for someone. I think if you just go with the intention to try and put your knowledge out there and, and help someone, you know, A, you'll learn a lot more about it yourself just by trying to teach it, but also, you know, someone's going to get something out of it. So for sure. But you mentioned practical advice for anyone that does take it on. Um, one thing that I found very helpful is find the time of day when you're the most mentally sharp because it is, I think, personally, I found it very mentally demanding and draining. And early in the morning is the best time for me once I've got some coffee in me. Um, so find that time of day and uh, just set it aside, allocate it to that to that task. Strong plus one on this. I have 10 a.m. set. I, uh, every day of my life, 10 a.m. is like my magic hour that only if you're at the tippy top of my priority list do you get that hour of my life. It's super, super positive advice. All right, I got, I got another. Uh, I'm going to call uh, Steve's question here. Um, what would be the, your most important thing to do when productionizing a cluster? Like what is tier number one? And it depends, doesn't count. Good point, Steve. We're not going to allow. It depends. What is, what is your first thing that you tell folks when they're when they want to make make sure that you're not this, this hopefully this doesn't sound like it depends but like make sure that you're actually understanding the developer experience you want to deliver um because that really is going to be like a guiding north star it's like a mission statement that like if you're unsure of whether you should deploy x or configure y you can always come back to that vision you have of an end state that you want to get to and it's funny I, I think we run into a lot of folks who do not do this like they go in and they say we're just going to bring up kubernetes because this is what people are doing now um, and that's a really short-sighted vision because like, what does it actually mean to bring up Kubernetes? What are you actually trying to solve for? So I think the most important thing we do is figure out what's the end state that people want to get to. Yeah, and don't do it in a vacuum. Um, one thing I've asked customers many, many times is what is the first tenant workload that's going to go on the cluster? And let's collaborate with them and make sure that this is a, a nice place for them to deploy their software. For me, uh, maybe a bit more tactical, um, don't get into like analysis paralysis. Um, I feel like it's very easy to try to 
analyze every single detail. You know, Kubernetes is super extensible. You can change things along the way. Um, so feel free to like, experiment. And if you find that, you know, you maybe took a wrong turn, that's fine. You know, you can always uh, fix it or, or change it, right? So that's that's uh, another one for me. I, yeah, I'm just going to cop out and, and piggyback on Josh and Rich and just say this, the number of times where we see organizations that have kind of scuppered themselves before they've started by not understanding what they're even trying to achieve when they start and the time that's wasted. I mean, it's in the millions of dollars of value <laughs> for sure. And one other yeah. thing I would like to throw out there is limit your scope. Don't try and build too much too early. Get an MVP running in production, learn the lessons and then build from there. But let's be real. Don't use IP tables is the actual advice. <laughs> I'm just joking. Yeah, IP tables is like a great example, actually, of something that's similar to what we're talking about, where like a lot of times folks will read like, oh, I can't use IP tables. Um, like I need to use a CNI that replaces it. And it's like, well, like maybe eventually, possibly, but like, do you actually understand the problem domain? Do you actually have pain that you're suffering from right now with IP tables? Um, and it's not that like we shouldn't strive to replace it with something more elegant, but like, is that your biggest priority? Like, again, like developers won't know if it's IP tables, right? So yeah, anyways. I think there's a danger with Kubernetes as well. Like there's a lot of hype around Kubernetes. There still is. There was previously, but there still is. And people will read everything there is to know and they'll catch on to one blog post or something. Which, like, you know, I'm going to pick on service mesh. It's fine. I don't hate service mesh, but there was a time six months ago where everyone absolutely had to have a service mesh, right? And when we spoke to every single person, almost, you know, you don't need a service mesh to stop with this. <laughs> it was going to make the rest, it was going to give them a 2% increase in whatever productivity they wanted in one area. And then, degrade the rest of the cluster, their security, increase the complexity by probably 50% in every other area. It was just like, you know, let's just, let's just solve for the low hanging fruit to begin with. Well, you know, I definitely see a lot of customers come at this, like, you know, looking at that CNCF landscape and, and view it as like, you know, Pokemon, you got to collect them all. Right. And, you know, um, no, no, you start simple, figure out what you need as you get that experience for sure. And nobody have a do you have a, a question a topic? Yeah, we got some more here in the um in our little document here. Uh Smalls had a good one at the very bottom. Um given the size of the book and the reputation of of Kate's being difficult, uh there was another one that asked us in the chat. What's your opinion of GCP autopilot or similar solutions? I've actually been digging into autopilot recently um, and I haven't dug into it enough, but from what I've seen, it's kind of like a super lockdown. And again, I, I haven't digged into it enough, but it, it feels like a super lockdown, super um, limited uh, Kubernetes distribution that's set up um, in a way where um, developers have like the safety guards that we kind of talk about in the book, which is interesting. Um, but at the same time, there's some limitations. So you, for example, you can't deploy, uh, if I'm not wrong, you can't deploy admission controllers. Um, you can't deploy mutating webhooks. You can't deploy CRD. So there's some limitations there, but I think it's, it's definitely an interesting, an interesting, uh, approach that they're taking. If it fits your use case, go for it. I'm a big fan of only making things just as complex as they need to be. So if a simple solution works, go for it. Strong plus one. Uh, we have some more here in the uh, the chat. This one is is a bit of a logistics question for the authors, and I think this this is just relevant for for everyone right now. Were there any challenges with with the constraints of the state of the world, given given the events of last year and this year, with with writing a new book? And and uh, if so, is there any tips or tricks that you learned that you might you might share that that you think would help other folks? I think it made it easier, honestly, um, which is bad to say because I don't want to talk about, you know, what's been going on in a positive light. But to be super honest, you know, we were kind of, you know, in our homes a lot of the time. At least I know I was. And I think these were these folks were, too. And um, yeah, I, I think it, it it made it a little bit easier. And, and it's something to know about us is we've been a distributed team for a really long time. So there wasn't this transition out of like not seeing each other in the office. Like we already don't expect seeing each other in the office. And that made the progression pretty natural. And as I said earlier, we've we've all worked together um, pretty closely for a while, so it came naturally. I'm trying to find the questions in the chat to be able to highlight them, but I'm scrolling around. And so, like, if we uh, if we use your question and don't give you credit or don't highlight it, that's just because um, I'm trying to make the tool work here. <laughs> well, Walid had one. I can read really quick. Yeah. Um, 
What would you say to people trying to bridge the traditional app or infrastructure environment to cloud native? For example, if you were to use multi-tenant data from NFS when it, uh, this was not very clear for Waleed. Maybe another way of, of asking that is uh, if you're trying to bridge the traditional app or infrastructure environment to cloud native, what, what are some tools and resources that, that you would suggest folks to use or, or anything in the book that you would call out? Yeah, it's, it's a really great question, right? Because sometimes we find ourselves trying to make old patterns work in the context of Kubernetes, and it's kind of like forcing a square peg into a round hole. And that can be pretty tough. But on the other side of things, when you already are adopting a Kubernetes initiative, it's, you know, it's already a pretty big hill to climb. And you don't want to turn that hill into a mountain by being like, and also, we're going to modernize and microservice all of our applications on top of introducing Kubernetes. Like That is a total recipe for disaster. Um, so I don't know if I have any particular tools um, other than just to say, like, do it gradually and understand how you can pick off piece by piece. Like, you can run NFS with Kubernetes, um, and maybe that's like the right solution for you out of the gate. And then you slowly enable developers on the benefit of a different storage model that is more cloud native um, over time. And the one thing I, that occurred to me while I was reading that question was, um, Having gone through that transition, one of the things that helped was finding ways to reliably automate your processes, because that was the biggest difference for me. At once upon a time, there were a lot of manual operations and finding ways to declare state and then automate realization of that state. Those are the core principles you need to revolve around. The tools aren't that important. Kubernetes is a really good one, <laughs> but um, as long as you stick to those principles, you, you, you can't go too far wrong. Yeah, and like if we, one of the things that we talk about in the storage chapter is like Kubernetes gives us a lot of ways to provide developers primitives where like the underlying data store could hopefully maybe become less important. Like you think about CSI drivers and storage classes. And if we can set up a self-serve storage model, um, whether it be backed by NFS, whether it be backed by EBS, whether it be backed by anything, um, as long as developers can quickly and easily access storage and demand it um, self-serve, uh, you're probably going to be in a pretty good place. And developers will probably like that because maybe we just work with really big legacy companies, but usually they're filing tickets uh, and waiting you know, eight weeks for that storage to become available, right? So that's a huge win from a developer standpoint. Yeah, I know. Um you know, as we were developing Kubernetes, you know, at some point we added features like, you know, being able to pin a pod to a specific host. And, um, and you know, that's wrong to some definition of wrong, but yet there's always situations, especially as you're looking to, you know, adapt existing systems where it's like, hey, you know, maybe I'll run something on Kubernetes. I'm gonna use a host path and pin it to that host and it's wrong, but it's also a way to make some, some, some forward progress while you're figuring out the rest of these patterns. And so I think that, you know, that evolutionary point of view, you know, is 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 definitely, you know, a tool in your toolbox as you're looking to actually complete this transformation. You shouldn't be afraid to use it where it's appropriate. But it can be a sharp tool. You can definitely, you know, cut yourself with it for sure. Yeah, just look at that while. Yeah. <laughs> so um okay, here's another question. This is not an audience question, but I'll ask it. Um uh are there any sort of subtweets in the book towards customers and customer situations that you all have seen? <laughs> you don't, please don't name names. I don't want to get anybody in trouble, but like, are there any times where you're writing stuff and you're like, Oh, I know who I'm pointing this one at. <laughs> yes. I think there are a couple, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now that you mention it, the book is a subtweet actually. <laughs> the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. It's a oh. five, five, 500 page subtweet. I think, I think more than that, I think there are definitely folks who would read the book and say, this is me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. I, I have a question here that this, this one's, I've been, this is a Nova question that I really, really want to ask because it, it also involves Joe to some, to some extent here. Um, so we did, Joe and Craig and Brendan did a panel in Seattle and it was like 2019, it was years ago. And one of the questions we asked them was looking back, if you, if you knew then what you know now, what would you have done differently? And listening to Joe and Craig talk about, you know, we should have, you know, managed infrastructure and all of these sort of early Kubernetes 1.0 questions. We're now at like the 200 level. And the question now I'm going to ask to all of you, looking back, is there anything that, that you think either we as Kubernetes authors or Kubernetes infrastructure engineers or operators, 
if we knew then what we know now that we would have done differently? There's there's Duffy's answer right there. <laughs> but yeah, the rest of you. Do less templating. Strong plus one. Less templating, you said, Rich? Yeah. I mean, templating, what, what type of templating are we talking about? Like YAML templating or? Yeah, templating resources to be deployed to a cluster. And and don't take that to mean never use templating. It's it's a good solution when um, when it's called for. But in my my feeling is it's 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 a workaround. There are much better solutions. And one of those solutions is using custom resources and controllers instead of templated resources, as an example. But it's it's important to recognize that the barrier to entry for using custom resources and controllers is higher than it is for templating. But the developer experience is is pretty awful at some point of complexity when templating. Yeah, this, this answer might be a cop out because I feel like Kubernetes is starting to solve this problem. And that is to find ways to make more provider specific configuration available in certain resources. So like, let's take something like Ingress as an example. Um, one time, a long time ago at CoreOS, we wrote an ALB Ingress controller and we got to the point where we were having people put JSON inside of annotations for their ingress manifests. Yeah, it was gnarly. It was really bad. Um, and I think that just spoke to the need to have like some provider specific pluggable models where like it is great to have a generic API that can float between providers, but there's also always going to be some provider specific details. And remember, like a lot of this stuff was pre like CRD. It was like when TPRs were, you know, becoming a thing and all this stuff. So I think that's something that is being fixed, but we need it for sure, um, especially with cases like ingress and otherwise. Yeah, I was going to piggyback on ingress as well. Uh, for whatever reason, my my mind went to ingress and the, and the, all the annotations in the ingress and, and working on contour and trying to take a, a stab at, at fixing uh, or improving that. And yeah, I think uh, that, that that's a big one for me. And I guess, yeah, my, one of mine probably wouldn't be something that would do differently. I just think there's maybe an area which is lacking right now that maybe could have been developed earlier, which is multi-cluster type support. Um, you know, I know there was efforts towards federations, effort towards, but now we talk about things like Capia out and multiple clusters, really the, you know, the best practice. And there are tools which enable easy creation of clusters where they never used to be the thing. But I think now the ecosystem is struggling to keep up. Well, how do I route traffic between these clusters? How do I do put apps on multiple clusters? How do I get visibility over multiple clusters? It feels like clust cluster previously was the top level resource in the hierarchy, but now it's you know first or second down, but I don't think we've got the top of the tree yet. Yeah, I mean, the, the multi-cluster stuff I think is absolutely fascinating. Um, and I think it definitely is cutting edge. The um, And I think one of the lessons is that as we moved from sort of the experience on a single node to the experience on a cluster from like Docker to Kubernetes, we needed to create sort of new patterns, new concepts, because you just can't treat a bunch of nodes as a single big node, right? There's, there's, there's just fundamental differences there. And I think there's going to be a similar transition as we move from a single cluster to multi-clusters where you just can't, you know, you know, you have multiple clusters for a reason. You can't just paper over the fact that you, you know, that that these are multiple clusters. And so figuring out the right abstractions to coordinate across clusters without just pretending it's a big cluster is going, I think, to be to be take some time for us to actually figure those things out, discover those patterns and 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 make them usable. Cannot agree enough. Uh recently starting a new job, looking at all my my teammates back back at, at the ranch right now working on Kubernetes. We're we're solving this this exact same problem. And it's, it's, this is something that like, you know, came up on Monday. It's, it's, it's a real thing and, and it real conversations are going into it. And, and I haven't been able to find a, a super great, compelling, easy button for any of this yet, which is now we're at the cluster cluster level of, of managing this. And what does that look like from an infrastructure perspective? It's, it's real. So there's one question now this scrolled off the screen here and this is getting a little bit and, and I, I have an agenda here and no, but you wrote Duffy next to it, but I don't know if Duffy asked this one and says, when do you think the benefit of using aggregated APIs becomes valuable in comparison to having resources defined um, as extensions, CRDs and existing API server? Uh, there is some real value in using a single controller manager for multiple API groups. How does this factor in? Um, where do you see like, so for those not familiar, aggregated APIs are an extension mechanism for Kubernetes that is, is you know, still not used all that often. 
where instead of actually using the API server and the etcd as storage, and you can essentially create new tables on that database, what it is is it's it's kind of like introducing a whole nother backend where the API server then calls into sort of a sub API server to handle a set of resources. And so it's a way of essentially splitting your control plane into multiple processes. And then those things can go through and, and you know, they don't have to use etcd to store, they can do whatever the heck they want to be able to do this. Um, thoughts on this in terms of like, are you seeing interesting stuff coming down the pike in terms of how people are using this? So I, I don't know about interesting stuff coming down the pike, but the use case is simply um, the Kubernetes API has a structure to it that um, fits certain patterns. And if, and if you need to do something that falls outside of those patterns, that's when it's a good idea. Um, and that's when it makes sense. That's when it makes sense to me. Uh, there are certainly things that we implement that use it. Um, metric server is one that comes to mind. Um, so you see it around, but I don't put it this way. I don't see custom implementations of aggregated APIs very often, if at all. Yeah, I think sometimes it's like the processing complexity um, and the amount of storage that you're trying to do uh, for a lot of use cases that I run into it. Um, we're kind of in a world right now where CRDs are just getting like, uh, you know, put in a humongous dump truck and just boom, shot into clusters, right? <laughs> um, and I think there's going to be more and more cases where, especially with more complex processing of these alternative APIs, um, aggregate API servers will be something that we'll, we'll look to to provide that level of functionality and ideally not bog down um, your Kubernetes cluster, right? So. Yeah, the one place that I think, you know, we see it is Entria uses it to actually reflect um, uh, essentially ephemeral status of networking. Um, so, so essentially exposing a bunch of data that you don't want to necessarily persist that, you know, and I think it's similar to the, to the, the metric server is there and, um, some unreleased stuff that we've been playing with around in, in VMware is essentially looking at how do you take something happening in one cluster and actually project it into another cluster using an aggregated API server. So essentially looking at using aggregated API servers to start solving some of these multi-cluster patterns. Still early sort of experimental stuff, but it's a really interesting idea to sort of use those things to create a window from one cluster into another cluster with an opportunity to sort of transmute and filter it along the way. Yeah. Cool. You have any more questions here, Nova? Uh, any last questions from the audience? I don't want us to take too much time of uh, too much of everybody's time here. I have I have another Nova question. I've got a yeah, couple of these if, if we want to keep going. Um, so th this this is just kind of like anytime you get you get people together to work on a project in general. I I, I love to ask this question. Which is, is there anything that that you learned or that you noticed that you wouldn't have otherwise noticed or learned? if it wasn't for working on the book together? Like, was there ever a moment when one of you was working on this one part of Kubernetes and another one had, you know, some thoughts on it, and then next thing you know, you realized, oh, we're solving the same problem, or there's some overlap here, or there's an interesting relationship that nobody noticed? Yeah, I'm trying to think. It's, I feel like we, we had a lot of those kind of instances, honestly. Um, Hmm. Do y'all remember anything in particular? There were a ton of times when I was reading a chapter or a comment on one of my chapters and I thought, I hadn't thought about it quite like that. I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but there were definitely a lot of them. Yeah, I mean, it's so many of the concepts are so interwoven, you know? So like when we're talking about, um, you know, CNI, for example, um, but Alex is writing the ingress uh, or service routing chapter, right? Those are closely related because they're all about like how the packets get in and what we do. And I think there were so many moments where it was like, oh, we're like approaching this lower level detail like this. And I'd read Alex's chapter and it would make me like want to completely restructure how I was thinking about mine. Um, so I can't think of a specific example, but I feel like we hit that quite a bit and did a lot of rewriting as we were reading each other's chapters. Um, yeah. What about the uh, the development process? Were you all simultaneously like pushing up to a shared Git repo so you were reading while you were writing or was it kind of like this dump truck CRD effect of just dump everything in at the last minute? I think we had like a month per chapter of, about a month per chapter of work, right? Maybe five weeks of which three and a bit weeks were writing and then we'd push it all up and then one and a half, two weeks were review. 
Um, so we tr- kind of tried to stick to that, I think. Um, and yeah, just pushing up and pulling down to Git and then periodically syncing to O'Reilly. I think we were using GitHub, but um, I think one of the interesting things to go back to the previous question was it one of the things that hit me um, a lot was how big Kubernetes now is that no one can hold it all in their head. And I would read someone's chapter like CSI where I haven't done a ton of work because you know we're, we're pulled in customer directions quite often. And I'd read like, there's no way that works like that. And then you go in the documentation, you play with it, spin up a cluster, and you're like, God damn, it does do that. Or like you come back to someone else, you're like, is that is that still an issue? Like if that was an issue three years ago. Is that still an issue? Yeah, it's still an issue. I can't believe that. Like I, so I feel like there were lots of little moments like that. But. All right, a couple more audience questions here. So Keith is asking, audio book going to happen? I don't know if our, uh, O'Reilly does audio books, but I think you know it's a great, great ASMR you know opportunity. <laughs> you know, read about Kubernetes. We can all fall asleep. <laughs> Imagine having someone read you a YAML file. Can you imagine? <laughs> Depends on know? who's reading it. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone know, anyone know how much Stephen Fry charges an hour? I know, you know, people say like, oh, that person could read the phone book and I'd listen. I'd be like, that person could read me a YAML file and I'd listen. <laughs> All right. And then our, our buddy Craig here, um, this is a good one. Um, what has been the most surprising thing you've learned about Kubernetes during the book or otherwise? Uh, so maybe some of these examples, the you know, around sort of like, is that how it works? I mean, are there specific examples that you all want to pull up? No. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I think okay. I'll, I'll go on a limb here, and it might make me sound a little bit silly. I think I did have the perception when I first got into Kubernetes that was like. Just give the developers Kubernetes. It's so freaking awesome. I think Kubernetes is so cool. I love containers. Like, heck yeah, I love this stuff. And then I had to take a step back as I got deeper into it and realized like, well, that's because like I like this area of software. Like somebody who's perhaps developing a Spring app might just find it to be a massive burden to like learn this completely new technology. And at the end of the day, the things they care about are extremely different than me. So I think what surprised me the most about Kubernetes in general, and that is reflected in this book, is simply that like know your audience really well, because like while you might be really excited about Kubernetes, your developers might potentially care less. And those are your customers, right? You want them to be really happy. So yeah, that's I think that returns to that whole thing of like, what are you trying to accomplish, right? And like Kubernetes is not the goal. It's it's a tool to get you to what you want to go to. And so just keeping that in mind, yeah. Good one. So I just thought of one of the most surprising things, and that was how complicated scheduling is. I, when I looked through what goes into the decision of where to put a pod, that surprised me. It surprised me a lot. It's easy on an empty cluster, man. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think for me, it was that Kubernetes isn't magic. I mean, like I, I discovered it fairly early on, but it was always sold or always always read as like it's a magic thing. It's just you throw a bunch of applications up there. If if a machine dies or a data center dies, everything automatically gets moved. Everything you know, except if it's in a different availability zone, if that doesn't work, or if it's using a special type of database, that doesn't work. You need to set up replication. You need to, and I'm like, wait, these are all the problems I had anyway. What what is it actually doing, right? <laughs> so I think just the realization that like you still have to have a, a really good understanding of how things work, and it's not magic. It's just providing you with a really good standard framework and set of guardrails and set of APIs and way of understanding the world to to be more efficient and better at doing those things. But there's no, you know, there's no magic secret sauce that Kubernetes now makes all the hard things go away, right? There's still hard problems, but they're yeah. just they're still hard problems. They're just in YAML now. <laughs> The YAML paints. <laughs> maybe that's that. Maybe that's the most surprising. YAML everywhere. Uh, um, I think for me, uh, and, and to piggyback on uh, on John, it's 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 not magic, but at the same time, there's so much like hidden complexity. Like for example, on the networking side, and like all the service routing stuff, IP tables, and like contract, and all of these things behind the scenes that it kind of abstracts from you as well. So it's kind of an interesting. It's not magic, but it is kind of magic. Um, it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's just mind boggling. All right, let's start wrapping up here. Nobody, do you have any last questions? Um, I do, I do. I, I really want to ask this one. This is a perfect right. last question. La- last question, like a, and then we'll let them have the last word. OK, it's a one word answer. I, where you can obviously answer more than that. But uh, a lot of people say, once you write a book, you're, you'll never do it again. So I have to ask. After writing the book, and you know, I have a physical copy here in my hand, 
Do you in the future have big hopes and dreams and aspirations for ever writing another book now that you've gone through the process? Yes, definitely. Yeah. For sure. Is it going to be a great American novel or is it going to be about Kubernetes? It might be a novel about that whale. <laughs> Honestly, that might be the next one. So I want to be the odd one out and say, no, I don't have any hopes of ambitions of doing it. Uh, I would do it given the right circumstance, but uh, yeah, not my favorite. And so, not, to lean, not to lean into this too much, but like working on it with you all was what would make me want to work on a book again. It would be with a group of humans where it would be an opportunity to not just put words on pages, but like talk about things and learn stuff from one another. Um, and I think that would be an easy, easy sell for me. So I have one last quick question for the authors. Does anyone have a hard copy yet? Because Chris has one and I don't. I don't. Nope. So I, I, lear I learned this the hard way. I really did. Uh, I set up an Amazon notification when Josh tweeted about this, or he might have told me. I forget how I learned about it. But at some point, I clicked the button in Amazon. And the reason I did that is because I've learned the hard way that if you don't actually go and order one, it, it takes a couple of weeks for you to get one from O'Reilly. So I went I went through the credit card, threw money at the problem, and, and just got it on Amazon overnighted. Also, I'm in San Francisco, so like things get here super quick. Pro tip. So Nova, when you did your book, they, they sent you a set of author copies, right? Um, so kind of, we, we also did the, the Heptio sponsorship thing and those ended up in the supply closet and that kind of turned into, I, I don't know, I guess I can say it out loud now, but that turned into my secret personal stash. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I don't even have a copy of my book here. I have a copy of your book, John. So maybe we can, we can trade. Cause but, I, um, I think at least in my contract, it was like, I get 10 copies for me. They're supposed to send you out author copies. We got 10. We were promised five, I think. Oh, I maybe when you have more authors. I mean, maybe yeah. if you're your sole author, they'll give you like 50. I don't know, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I guess I do have a copy, but they also, I got this one sent to me. This one was kind of cool. It got translated oh, yeah, to to Korean or I believe, I think it's Korean. I, I'm not totally sure. That, that's a lot of fun. If they do the, the international translations, they'll send you copies of the, the international books. And that, that's really cool to see. Um, and there's a, the, there's a person who does it. So you get like the person who translated and their like life story and where they're from and why they translated your book. And it's like a personal thing. It's, it's pretty cool. All right. Well, all right. Um, you know, Rich, John, Josh, Alex, any last words that you want to words of wisdom you want to leave folks with? We hope you like it and uh, genuinely expect to find a lot of interesting perspective that you can add to your perspective tool belt and maybe even expect to disagree with some stuff in the book. That's that's super healthy. You don't need to take it wholesale. It's not a manual that's going to get you to production Kubernetes. It's just a bunch of ways that we've looked at this space and, and been successful in the past. Plus one. Yeah. Challenge it. Just use your own brains. <laughs> we tried to use ours. Maybe it worked. I don't know. Alex, anything? No. I mean, yeah. Uh, as as everyone said, it's our way of looking at things. Um, if you disagree with something, we'd love to hear it as well. So definitely, we we I think we have a repo uh, in GitHub, or we should have a repo. I think we have an org, and we are we're gonna open a repo where you know maybe we can uh, interact and 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 discuss and, and and yeah, talk about the book. Awesome, awesome. I know, like when Nova worked with. Um with uh with jason they they actually have a website for the whole thing and uh i don't know if y'all are still keeping that up to date are you nova yeah 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 we have um uh it's tgik.info justin is he set it up and uh he, he's the one who kind of manages it but it's cool because okay. it's like that that i can just drop like tell somebody off the cuff or whatever and it's got like a little bio about me a little bio about him and then like a big amazon logo so like at least at like <laughs> so, yeah, you superficial might wanna, like, level you know it looks legit, or something right? and, and, and start a start a website for the book. I'm just creating more work for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. And then you can host it in Kubernetes and tell us about your experience. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, y'all, for joining us. And thank you for the audience for sticking with us through this. Um, you know, great book. I you know, love hearing the stories for how it all came together and uh look forward to the next one. <laughs> Maybe in a little bit though. All right. Thank you, everybody. And we'll see you next week. Not sure who's going to be presenting. Maybe I'll, uh, you know, ask one of these folks to go deep on something. But uh, uh, everybody have a great weekend. Thanks for getting up, staying up, uh, hanging out with us. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>